we're trying to talk about fractures now. And you have to know basic fractures. Even if you're not an orthopod, you have to know basic fractures, all right? So one of the things that we're gonna talk about is one of the most common scenario for getting a fracture, meaning you fall down on your outstretched hands. Guys, when you fall, you catch yourself on your outstretched hand. Generally speaking, the fracture you get is based upon your age. So let's talk about this. And this is very, very, very important. Okay, if you're a kid and you fall down on your outstretched hands and you get a fracture, usually it is a supracondylar fracture of the humerus. If you're senior in age, 60s, 70s, and you fall on your outstretched hand, you will usually get a Collie's fracture. And a Collie's fracture, as you remember, looks like a dinner fork, kind of bent like that. And it's a fracture of the distal radius and the styloid process of the ulna. Collie's fracture, treated similarly by immobilization, just like the supracondylar fracture. Those are very straightforward. So a kid falls on outstretched hand, supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Senior person falls outstretched hand, most commonly a Collie's fracture. But then you get into the one in between, meaning the young adult, possibly the middle-aged adult, and they fall on their outstretched hand and they have pain in the anatomic snuff box. What is the anatomic snuff box? Well, if you look at your, your thumb and you lift up your thumb like that, you have a little pocket here. That's called the anatomic snuff box. If someone has pain in that area, you have to think about a scaphoid navicular fracture of the wrist. This is very, very important what I'm gonna tell you, so follow me, okay? So obviously when they have pain in the snuff box, you're gonna think, okay, scaphoid navicular fracture. You get an X-ray. If you see the fracture, well, fine, you treat it. They're not gonna test you on something like that. That's, that's not, doesn't require a whole lot of insight, but they're gonna test you on this. Let's say you get an X-ray and you don't see a fracture, yet the patient's complaining of pain in the anatomic snuff box. Well, what do you do? Do you just send the patient home? No, you treat it as if you see a fracture line on the x-ray. And so you're saying, well, why do you do that? Well, you treat it in a splint or a cast and you have the patient come back two weeks later and you repeat the x-ray. Now, the patient will get perhaps mad at you and say, Dr. Hill, you know, you just took an x-ray two weeks ago. Why are you repeating the x-ray? So it's a good question, right? It's a good question. Let me explain why you're repeating the x-ray. Remember that plain x-rays show fractures by contrast black and white contrast. And if the fracture is so close together, there won't be any contrast going through and you won't see it. Well, then why do you repeat it in two weeks? Well, when you have a fracture 
you have those little cells called osteoclasts. And I always tell the patients that those cells, osteoclasts are like, remember Pac-Man? I know that was one of the early video games, but remember Pac-Man? Well, osteoclasts are kind of like Pac-Man. And what they do is they eat up and clean up the fracture line so that instead of being really narrow, it increases it slightly so you can get contrast and see the fracture. Now, not only for the test, you must understand that the answer to the question is why do you repeat the x-ray in two weeks? is because you can get better visualization because of the osteoclastic activity. But what do you tell the patient? You say these little cells that are like Pac-Man, clean up the fracture so you can see it, okay? So now the patient understands and you understand. All right, so now the patient is back in two weeks. You got the x-ray and if it shows the fracture, fine. They're not gonna test you on that, that's, that's too easy. They're gonna test you on this. Patient comes back in two weeks, you got them in a, uh, in a cast or a splint and they still have pain in their stuff box and you get an x-ray and it is red as normal. In that situation, you must do imaging to prove that there is no fracture, meaning either an MRI, CAT scan, or bone scan, and they're not gonna make you choose. Personally, most people get MRIs, but you gotta get some imaging study to determine whether or not there actually is a fracture. Well, why? And this is the test question. And this is the life question. If you have a scaphoid fracture and you do not treat it, you will get a frozen wrist due to avascular necrosis. That's so important, I'm gonna repeat it. If you do not treat a scaphoid fracture, you will get a vascular necrosis and a frozen wrist. And guys, if you have a frozen wrist that you can't move, that's an unbelievable disability. So therefore you must, as I have said in every lecture I've given you, be safe. Okay, so now let's say we have that patient. Let me go through the scenario, came in, pain in the snuff box, X-ray was negative, come back two weeks later, still pain in the snuff box. And X-ray again was negative and you get an MRI and it was normal. And you tell the patient, you're lucky. And the patient starts yelling at you saying, hey, you, you kept me off work. You put me in a splint or a cast for a number of weeks. Uh, I couldn't use my my hand, my arm, um, you cost me a lot of money. This came out of my deductible. Why didn't you get the MRI straight away? Good question, right? Well, in this day and age, meaning at the time that I am recording this, the insurance companies won't let you go straight away to an MRI for a possible scaphoid fracture. They just won't. The patient says, hey, doctor, I will pay for it out of my pocket. Fine, but that's an awful lot of money. I suspect if I had a crystal ball, I would think by the time you guys get out and practice, it is highly likely that the cost of MRIs will go way down and we will able to get it straight away. So a patient doesn't have to go through that whole protracted process you know, to find out that indeed they don't have an injury. But again, for the test and for life, at this time, you got to go through that process. And again, the most important thing, the most important thing is 
you must be safe. Because if you have avascular necrosis, that is an irreversible process and it causes significant problems. So just remember that. And, and one of the things that I'm trying to teach you as well for life, you gotta explain things to the patient in a way that they understand. You can't say, well, the osteoclastic activity, you can't talk like that. You have to talk about Pac-Man and you have to talk about why you're doing what you're doing. Now, let's continue. Remember, we learned about the epiphysis and the growth plate in children. This is really important because that's how their long bones grow. Well, simple test question and life question. If the epiphysis and the growth plate are displaced by an injury, not broken, not fractured, but displaced by an injury. You don't have to operate, you just have to relocate it. But if they are fractured, meaning the epiphysis and the growth plate are fractured, you need surgery. Because if you don't do surgery and fix them, that bone will not grow normally. So very simply, if they're displaced, put them back. But if they're fractured, if they're broken, you got to fix it operatively. That's all you need to know. All right.